Hey there, people out there. If if you're out there, who knows? Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell. Uh, and I think that the notification only just went live on the Discord. So we have that at least going there. Uh, it's good to see all of you. And we're here. Uh, it is the beginning of a long weekend for me, which I am definitely happy to see. Hey, most interesting critter. You are the most interesting critter by definition, and I'm pleased to see that. Uh, yeah, it, it's been a it's it's been an interesting day, um, and it's going to be a much better weekend. And I am looking forward to it for sure. Hey, Mangani, thanks so much. It's good to be here, and it's good to see you. It's always good to see you. Um, I'm very pleased that uh, I get to kick off my. Long weekend by doing something that I like, which is talking about uh, doing doing this, which I like. So um, I am very happy to be here. I keep saying that, uh, but let's uh, let's kind of get into this. Let's let's see. So one of the things that I I will point out is that um, off in the Discord today we had a couple of questions coming in, uh, and. Those questions came from Requiem. Requiem isn't here yet, so I'm probably gonna wait until Requiem actually arrives in the chat uh, to, to address those particular questions. But uh, one thing that I will say is that we started off today just kind of like we were uh, dealing with lights. So our lighting situation is a little different than it has been before. And one of the things that I've realized is that OBS uh, really really likes to uh, to forget lighting settings, <laughs> which is just like enraging um, sometimes. But uh, eh, we we deal with it. We make it work. Uh, but at the very least, the camera's a bit sharper on me right now, which is uh, which is what we want. And we'll we'll sort out all of the rest of this stuff um, properly at another point. Um, I'm certain so. Just not necessarily something that we have to make a huge, uh, huge worry about right now. Uh, let's see. Hey, Kung Fu Fenris. I'm glad you had a successful session. Let us know how it went. You're running Scion right now. Um, one of the interesting things coming out of Scion just recently is uh, uh, that the Onyx Path has signed a deal to uh, develop a Scion television series. Now, the television series that have been based on role-playing games that come from White Wolf properties, uh, because Onyx Path is, like, they essentially got Scion from White Wolf. Uh, the, uh, I mean, there was Kindred the Embarrassed. I know it was Kindred the Embraced, but it's it's Kindred the Embarrassed. Watch it, you'll see. Um, which was their attempt at kind of uh, busting Vampire the Masquerade out into the, into the mainstream, and it did not really work. Hey, there's a Requiem! We'll be able to answer Rec Room's questions. Um, and thank you for the subscription. Very appreciated. Look any as well. Uh, TV shows and RPGs are bad. I mean, yes, that that is that is the case. And I I, I think that it takes um, it takes a certain deft hand to be able to take mediums and put them into another one. I mean, comic book stories making their way onto film. Do they work or not? Thank you, Kung Fu Fenris, for that. Uh, and role-playing games showing up on film or television. I mean, Underworld is essentially uh, vampire and werewolf in film form, although they got sued by White Wolf. And uh, that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see whether Scion actually makes it out as an official uh, represented product. But, you know, I'm I'm interested to in seeing what, what they're going to do with it. Uh, Scion is one of those games that I wish... <laughs> Don't talk with the Underworld or White Wolf folks about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, it's... Uh, I work for a company that made an un a licensed Underworld game um, once upon a time. So uh, there there are... Or at least there were Underworld posters all up over the office. I don't know. I haven't been in the office for over a year. So uh, who knows there? Uh, but one thing that I can say is when... Um, when dealing with um, Scion. Uh, Scion is one of those games that I wish 
that uh, it would be easier for us to stream. But as we've said kind of recently, uh, we haven't. Uh, well, I would I would totally understand getting a very pointed stare uh, by Justin Achille for, for mentioning that. Achille? Achille? I, I, I assume it's Achille, but I've never actually heard his name pronounced. So um, the... Scion is a, a, a fantastic game. For those of you who aren't aware of it, Scion is a game which is essentially American gods, or at least sort of American gods, but in role-playing form, in that the player characters are the offspring of deities, and they interact with the world kind of as, first as heroic mortals, but then they slowly ascend to uh, demigodhood and then godhood. I'm oversimplifying it, but it essentially incorporates all different pantheons from around the world. Uh, the main reason why we have chosen not to stream it is because we don't necessarily feel comfortable being able to portray all of those different cultures and religions in a way that would be um, appropriate for a worldwide audience. This is not to say that you shouldn't be able to try it out in your own games. After all, the reimagining of deities is something that's really cool and interesting. Uh, Hades did it just recently, the video game, by taking the Greek pantheon and essentially saying, well, we'll do whatever the fuck we want with it. They don't have to look like ancient Greeks. They can look like whatever we want because they're deities. And I think that's great. I think that that's a wonderful way of portraying them. However, because Scion is set in the real world and because it deals with pantheons from around the world, uh, it, it runs into situations where I personally don't feel comfortable running it um, in, a, in an open public setting. Because I think that there'd be way too many opportunities for me to, uh, to not be able to do the research necessary and to fuck it up. Um, no, it doesn't have to be the actual offsprings. That, that is true. Um, uh, you can do whatever you like in your games. But we kind of are like, the only pantheons that I'd be able to represent are like pantheons that are, you know, directly related to my own culture, but I don't identify with any of those pantheons. So it's it's tough. Um, but as a, as a thing that can be more tightly scripted, I think that that will be interesting to see on television. And I can definitely see it being interesting in home games, but it's probably as a game that we're going to stream, probably not. And for the same reason is why we may not end up uh, uh, ever doing something like Legend of the Five Rings. Uh, it's not that they're bad games, it's that uh, we are acutely aware that we're for white folk, so. Uh, and I, 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 the first, the first edition systems for Scion are completely busted from the get go. Um, oh yeah, the Irish and North. Like I am, I am of British and Scottish descent. I am acutely aware of my, uh, of of the way that I would come across if I necessarily stepped into the Irish minefield, um, where I may be considered as other. So, yes, American Gods, Percy Jackson, and Wicked and Divine. Um, I could, but I'm not that interested in just doing Arthurian, um, Arthurian legend. Uh, this easy runs faster than I saw. It looks like a teleprompter. I, uh, that, that's interesting. I guess maybe because it's, uh, it's less lag to get to Twitch in that, in that way. Um, so it, all in all, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that Scion is a game definitely worth looking at. I think I've read, I own the source books for second edition. I think they're really cool. It's just something that we're not going to stream. If we were alone at home, then things can be a little more forgiving. Um, and I'm not saying it's okay to be racist when you're alone. That That's not the case. But uh, there's more room for us to experiment and to make mistakes um, without it being completely open into the public. So it's something that we're most likely not going to to do. Uh, it's like I it, it's it's not that I won't portray cultures or races or sexualities that I'm not. That's not the case. It's just that Cyan is so directly related to those cultures and those religions. Cause that's the the basis of the game. And that's where I don't necessarily feel like we're we're equipped to be able to do that. Yeah, a Kickstarter out for Adventure, the pulp game for Trinity. So Trinity, the Trinity Continuum uh, is essentially uh, Aeon and Aberrant 
and Adventure. And Adventure is sort of, yeah, it's based on like Indiana Jones, Pulp Fiction kind of thing. Um, and yes, it's rooted in stories of cultures. And I don't necessarily know all those stories, and I definitely don't have time to do all the research to do them. So uh, I can't do it publicly. Uh, if I'm if I'm writing something destined for a wide audience, I want to make sure that I'm representing it properly, and I don't think I can do that here. Uh, so yeah, if if you're interested in, in looking at that, it's based on the story path system, which is a modification of the storyteller system. And uh, I haven't actually played Story Path specifically yet. I've looked into it. I think that Story Path is better than First Edition Scion. I'm not certain that it's something that I'm like super into at the moment, but we'll see because I also know that Exalted Essence, which is now moved into uh, art direction, uh, which basically means that its manuscript is pretty close to complete as far as I can tell, is... Uh, is also somewhat based on story path. So, uh, Requiem, that's that's really good to hear that um, that Scion is well researched. See, like that's the sort of thing that makes me think, like, okay, great, like that gives players a basis to step into the game and be able to do it, uh, which is why it's it's something that I think that I can recommend. Um, but also, you know, talk to other people. I'm, I'm just one person. Uh, but we'll, I mean, that's, that's kind of the way it has to be, right? That's how it always is. Uh, but yeah, uh, that is exciting news about Essence though. So if I uh, go into uh, Onyx Path, and I look at their Monday meeting notes uh, very specifically, uh, we can note that Exalted Essence uh, is now in art direction, um, which means that it's getting close to when it will be able to be kickstarted. So we're looking forward to that. Not sure when that's going to happen, obviously, but I'm I'm very so Kung Fu Fenris is sure that Essence is the next Kickstarter, but when will it actually kickstart? Because is it going to be happening in the next month? Is it going to be happening in the next, you know, three, four months? It kind of depends. So uh it's it's definitely something that I'm keeping an eye on. You think that as soon as Adventure Adventures Kickstarter is done, that's when they're gonna launch it? Uh I I hope, but we'll see. Yeah, I know they do Kickstarters each month. I'm just, there are other products out there as well that are, um, one day White Wolf will make Werewolf fifth. I, I mean, we're all waiting for it. I'm waiting for it. I know for sure that that's the, that's one of my most anticipated products. Exalted Essence, uh, Exalted Essence is Exalted third edition, but with a more simplified and streamlined rule system. Um, so not necessarily dumbing it down, but in, it's an attempt to make Essence a lot less crunch heavy. Um, and I'm curious to see what they're gonna do to, to, to make that happen because for streamed games, that might be perfect, even though I do like the Exalted uh, third edition system. And then uh, Werewolf Fifth is, I'm anticipated, I'm anticipating it. I'm also wary of it. Uh, we've spoken about Werewolf in the past on this show, but obviously the idea that uh, a game that I am very, very fond of, but that I also recognize has some troubling elements to it. I want to see what they're going to do to fix those troubling elements. And we'll see. Uh, still want to see what they do to Siderials in the third edition? I mean, they will. They will. Trust me, for non-seamed games, Essence is needed as well. I think that Essence is kind of like a perfect example of here is something that we can potentially do uh, for people who don't necessarily want to delve so deeply into Crunch. Um, and knowing that when we're playing online, we don't want to engage with the systems so heavily that it slows the game down. Um, and knowing that some people choose to play games for a couple of hours at a shot as opposed to an all day affair, uh, Essence could end up being a great product for that. Uh, Werewolf Fifth, if, that, if they manage to smooth those edges, uh, something that I'm very much looking forward to. But we will 
we will see how that goes. Uh, yeah, five hour sessions is it gets harder and harder as as you grow older. Uh, the idea of being able to set aside a whole day for gaming is is a great thing, but I also don't know whether that's something that I want to do. I'd rather meet more regularly for shorter games than to say, okay, well, it's going to be all day, but I can only devote one day every three months to running an all day session. It gets harder to to justify at that point. So, we'll we'll see. Uh, I also know that Kung Fu Fenris is a big fan of Werewolf, um, if you couldn't tell by the username, but uh, I haven't heard anything since they announced the repatriation of Werewolf back to the World of Darkness team. So <laughs> my players start dozing off around 10 p.m. It's hard. I mean, yes, you want your players to be alert, which definitely helps. Uh, Requiem says that uh, can do either all day every month or three to four hours every week. So yeah, I I definitely prefer to, to play more often and at a slower, um, more often and, and at a smaller session rate. But then again, I also stream games, right? And for stream games, I definitely don't wanna make people say, well, you can show up, but it's gonna be all day. Like we've only done that a couple of times. And when we've done that, we've kind of made like well in advance notice that that's what's happening, so. Um, you've heard that Justin is basically focusing on that and the Sabbat book as he's living in Stockholm. Uh, well, that's, that's good. Uh, Sabbat is probably going to be one of the harder books to write for Vampire and not fuck it up, considering just how much, uh, the, the microscope is pointed directly at Paradox and, uh, White Wolf with the World of Darkness because, uh, oof, they, they done fucked it up. Uh, before they repatriated it, so. Uh, if I was in charge, I'd lock him in there with food. Perhaps. So, Requiem, this is something that you that you bring up, and I, I am going to touch upon this briefly because I do have thoughts on it before we actually get to you, your questions, but uh, running more often for shorter sessions helps a lot with pacing. It can. What really depends is what kind of games you're running. If you're running very heavy war game mechanics, like if you're running Pathfinder and D&D and you've got all the figurines set up and you're running big, complicated battles that last for a long time, uh, sometimes you may want to run longer sessions because in terms of pacing, uh, you want to make sure that the game session has a good mix of combat and non-combat and combat takes a long time to run. So if you make combat really complicated, also setting it up, uh, breaking it down afterwards can take a while. So you may want to invest in more playing time so that you can take advantage of that as opposed to saying, well, we're playing for three hours, but two and a half of those hours are going to be fighting out one battle and then you get to role play for five minutes and then it's over. Uh, that can be really rough. So uh, I, for instance, um, I have been playing recently in a, uh, uh, a group uh, at work where we're playing Dungeons and Dragons for essentially 45 minutes once a week. And we've taken to that. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Like I've been doing it, uh, partially because I really like the group that we're playing with and partially because I kind of want to keep my D and D chops up a little bit because I'm, I don't know, it's good to know those sorts of things, but running D and D in 45 minute chunks is really rough, especially when combat's around because combat takes like three sessions. <laughs> And when combat takes three sessions, it's hard for me to get invested uh, in it. I mean, we're doing it and I'm glad that we're doing it because we're just basically stealing lunch breaks in order to do it. But it is it is difficult. It is difficult to to be able to to run that and make it feel like it's uh, something worth investing in. So uh, at any rate. Uh, let's get into our topics for today, unless we want to discuss more on um, coming it up. Combat Exalted can take forever, to be fair. Uh, that is absolutely true. Combat in many systems can take forever. Uh, combat in Exalted, I can run faster than I can run D&D &D combat sometimes. D&D &D combat is uh, strategic and math-based. Exalted Combat is more cinematic-based, and cinematic-based I can fudge easier. D and D, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, appeal to D and D is because you're actually playing a, a a tightly designed 
game where the math has been worked out. I've said this many, many times before. Um, and Exalted, the math isn't worked out at all, so it's a bit easier to fudge. Um, and because D&D is also designed to be played with miniatures, getting those miniatures set up, getting the maps rolled out, putting the miniatures in place, moving the miniatures, all of that takes time. Um, time that you can't really get away from, so... There is that. Uh, six hours for a combat. Yikes. I mean, look, I so there are times where that's exactly what you want. And also, m players spend a lot of time looking at their sheets. And they want to use the cool tools that they've bought. They want to play with their with their characters. The characters that they've, you know, invested charms and, and or spells or abilities, no matter what the system is. And if you just basically let them spend their time and experience and effort into all of those things and then never engage with them, then you're cheating your players out of an experience that they may want. So uh, it is a uh, it, it, it is a, a thing to, to deal with. All right, so let's get back to this. If I go into the Clinic Hours channel on the RPG Clinic Discord, there were uh, two sets of questions that were asked. Both of them, I believe, by Requiem. Uh, so let's see if I can call them up here. So Requiem says here, I'm going to paste it in chat um, so that we can all have a look. All right. Oh, it's okay to have questions. I want questions. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a show. When you have NPCs as part of the PC group, so for example, in the Dragonblood Academy game that I'm running, Siantel and Flivien, how do you keep them engaging? Add their own input in the plot without giving them too much or give them just a little nudge without being overbearing? It seems like something that would be difficult to have NPCs that are so close to the group without it being too much. So, uh, Squeaks in the Dark is ahead of Exalted Essence in terms of being ready for Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah, I see, I, I figured that there may be some other things that might be more ready. Uh, it's going to depend on what, what they choose, right? I, I think it might be a coin flip. Um, all I know is that based on the people who I've been talking to, uh, they're, they're not willing to commit to any uh, date just yet. So, I, so NPCs as allies. We've spoken before about GMPCs. GMPCs are when a storyteller or a game master or whoever creates an NPC and imbues them with so much importance that they may as well be a PC. Uh, they've created a protagonist and protagonists in a role-playing game, for the most part, are supposed to be the player characters. They're the ones who are supposed to be the ones driving the story, the world and the universe literally, uh, well, actually figuratively, revolves around them. But when a GM starts creating a PC and putting it into the party and saying, well, you know, like I'll, it's I've I've created this character and uh, I get to do what I want with it. You, you've run into a bit of a situation. Not only are you now uh, stealing away some of the thunder from the players, but it's difficult sometimes to balance your ultimate authority with being a player character. It's also can be difficult to not overshadow the player characters because you have the ability to do what you like with these characters. It's dangerous. Uh, it's, it's a little bit um, more dangerous, I find, uh, than a lot of GMs give credit for. And I've seen it happen a lot. I've seen it happen in LARP play. I've seen it happen in tabletop play. I've seen it happen in online play. It's especially common in online play because uh, there, there's a layer of uh, separation and you can also smurf. You can make it so that nobody knows that your player character who presents as a player character is actually controlled by a GM. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not gonna focus on the online you know, PCs that aren't revealed as game master characters because that's straight up cheating, but I can speak to the other kind. It's a bad idea. 
So what Requiem is asking for, though, is how do you have NPC allies that don't fall into these traps? Uh, you've never heard about what before, uh, Kung Fu Fenners? Just out of curiosity. Uh, NPC, tr uh, NPC allies are one of those things. Smurfing? Yeah. Uh, smurfing is actually a term from, uh, from online gaming. And online gaming is, uh, to smurf is when you're playing in a, in a ranked situation where there's matchmaking that will match you against, uh, other players to smurf is to create a new account or to deliberately sabotage an account so that it is matched with lower skilled players and then to come in as a hired skilled player so that you can basically stomp the competition uh it is unfortunately common to see in a lot of different genres of games uh first person shooters see it quite a bit it's a very common thing that you'll see in MOBAs, although Valve has recently decided to eliminate smurfing by saying that anyone caught with more than one account is simply going to lose them all. Uh, Riot Games' League of Legends has, um, it has language that says that smurfing is against their code of conduct, but they don't do a whole ton um, openly to ban those accounts. There are, however, um, they do take smurfs and put them a little bit on a prisoner's island, which means that if the algorithm thinks that you're smurfing, then it will match you against other smurfs. So you kind of get stuck in that situation instead. But in the context of role-playing, smurfing would be to pretend that you're a player character when in fact you are not. Uh, in LARP play, uh, you've seen the kind of games that I run. You see that one of the things that I like doing is I like creating a universe around the player characters to give them something to care about beyond just like, do this random thing for this random person because they're an authority figure, or do this thing for this person because I told you that you should care about them, or do this thing for this person because you as a player character arbitrarily decided that you were gonna care about them. What I like to do is give people a, a cast of characters and actually have people like them, um, or if not like them, uh, figure out how they feel about them and then make their decisions on what they're going to do based on that. Uh, and if you can, if you can do that, then it feels more organic. The players get more invested in the world and then the actions that they take feel more grounded in decision making and in storytelling than I am doing this because that is the axiom of this universe in order to make sure that the game works. But by doing that, I'm creating NPC allies. And one of the things that my players like to do is they like to collect allies and then have them roll with them as part of their crew. Well, unfortunately, that makes me run into a problem. And here are the, the problems that I have to overcome. The first is, as I said earlier, I have to avoid creating a Game Master PC. I do not want these characters to overshadow the PCs. I do not want these characters to make the player characters, uh, or sorry, make the players feel like I am essentially committing the role-playing equivalent of masturbating, where I'm sitting there doing everything for myself, playing the characters that I wanna play, supporting the stories for my characters instead of them. The second thing is I have to make sure that the characters aren't useless. After all, if I say, okay, well, uh, you can have allies, but since I don't want them to overshadow you, they can't do anything, they become a lot less interesting for the players to interact with, and player characters don't have a reason to keep them around. So now we kind of have a push and pull situation. On the one hand, I have to create characters that aren't effective, and on the other hand, I have to create characters that are. So what do we do about that? Um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can deal with this. The first is there are games that have systems for what are essentially, and I'm gonna use a D&D second edition term here, henchmen, uh, characters or hirelings or uh, mercenaries, characters who are part of your, part of your, uh, part of the PC's group, but they are controlled essentially by the player characters themselves. They can say, okay, well, I'm going to do this. And then that character who is my character's follower, they're going to do that in, like at, at the same time, essentially declaring actions for more than one. That's one way that you can work it out, especially if your game has systems for that. But I'm not certain that that's my favorite. Uh, the second way that you can do it 
is you can create the characters, you can deliberately underpower them compared to the player characters, and then have them basically roll with that crew. So they're still useful and effective, but they won't be as effective as player characters. And again, you run into some issues here. It's It can be, look, all of these solutions are, are usable. I'm not saying that any of these are like, don't do this at all. But uh, one thing that you can look at in terms of uh, in terms of this is when you have a player character who uh, is in the game, player characters aren't necessarily optimized. You as a storyteller or GM have the ability to optimize a character for a situation because you control the situation. And that's a, that's a key um, disparity that we have to work out here. Even if your character is underpowered, you can inadvertently make the character overpowered. So, something to keep in mind. And the second is that if you make your character too underpowered, they can't roll with the PCs because then they'll get rolled. Uh, if the character's too weak, they show up on the field of battle, and then if you want to make sure that they're fighting a an equivalent force, then they're outmatched because they cannot stand up to what the player characters can stand up to. So instead, what I do with allies is... Uh, twofold. The first is I never strongly define who the allies are. Um, I don't ever reveal their character sheets to players uh, and I deliberately keep them vague and loose. That's not to say that I ignore systems. Uh, I, I just do not give them such strict definition because they don't deserve to have the same granular control as a PC does in a lot of ways. Villains, maybe they do, uh, depending on how you just choose to run your games. But allies are essentially um, people who can help out. But the other thing that I do, aside from making these characters vague, is I encourage a situation where these characters, first of all, have a streak of independence to them, so they will not necessarily only do what players tell them to do. And I also make sure that these characters uh, have objectives that are different than the ones that the player characters have. That's not to say that they don't necessarily have the same goals. But for instance, uh, if I have three player characters and they're like, here's the plan, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna do this. What are the allies going to do? I make sure the allies preferably aren't always necessarily doing the same thing as the PCs are. This is a situation in which I'll encourage splitting a party because I'm splitting away the allies from the PCs while still enabling them to use them as part of their plans. Uh, for example, if you have a group that's storming a castle, then I might say like, okay, yeah, you've got allies. Well, this ally will do will go with you, but this other ally is going to go off and do something different. Um, Maybe that person is running recon. Maybe that person is scouting ahead and will come back occasionally and give information. Maybe that character is going to uh, go off and search a different room than the player characters. No matter what, when I'm doing this, I am encouraging the players to think of their allies as resources that they can use, but not necessarily fully control. In combat, I often have them do only the vaguest of actions. I describe them as if they are actions that people can all get behind because I do think that it is still important that they feel fully realized and that they have, um, you know, appropriate actions. But I don't go into like, this character is using this spell and attacking with this role, with this initiative and this uh, weapon, so they have a pool of this and then I will roll. It isn't important. I move through the allies fast. I make sure that they go by quickly. I fudge things if I need to, if I'm if I'm trying to get things done sooner, especially if the outcome of their dice rolls is something that isn't going to directly affect the player's combat. And I do this because I want them to feel useful and I want the players to start seeing them as part of the background when they need to be in the background. When the players need to be at the forefront in the spotlight, they should be able to take a step back and let the others fight. Think about um, think about any of uh, a uh, major superhero movie where there's a ton of characters all at once, right? Uh, I am going to 
I'm going to be speaking about Avengers Endgame. I'm not going to reveal any major plot points, but I am going to be revealing that at one point, um, one element of a scene that happens later on in a movie, in the movie. So if you are really desperate to see Endgame and you haven't seen it yet, um, I will wave when I'm finished discussing it. I will do this. But for now, I'm going to let you mute for a second. Okay, in Endgame, at one point, there's a climactic battle that involves dozens of participants, and not all of these participants are incredibly important to the outcome of the fight. Um, you know, the, uh, for example, uh, when the Wakandans show up on the battlefield, Black Panther is someone who you want to pay attention to, but you can't necessarily pay attention to every single character that came through those portals from Wakanda. Uh, there's just too many of them. You want to know that they're there. You want to know that they're doing something useful and interesting. You want to feel good about their presence, but you don't necessarily want to focus on every individual character. Even if it was just the Wakandans, there would still be too many of them, right? The reason There's a reason why Black Panther has a main character, T'Challa, and has the other characters as supporting. So you want your supporting characters to take a step back, to fade off into the background, but still look like they're being awesome. Uh, and I think that this is possible. This is absolutely possible uh, in a game. Uh, so Requiem brings up one of the things... Uh, Exalted kind of has that in the form of retainers, characters that are controlled by the player. Yeah, to a certain extent. I... I will say this for for myself personally, I don't like using retainers as a game mechanic. Um, I I don't like ha letting players say, I essentially want extra characters that I can control. Um, I prefer to let them do that through role playing than do it through mechanics. I, but that's me. That's my personal take on it. But no matter what, even if retainers are there, I'd want to make the retainers um, vague. You know, I, I would want somebody to say, okay, you go and attack that group over there. Fine, like fantastic. But like, I don't want to roll that combat out very specifically. I will do rolls. I will do like some some comparisons and the closer they are to what the player characters are doing, um, the more important that the player characters are aware of what's happening or the more important it is to follow along the mechanics um, at, at stake. But it isn't something that I want to give them full granular control. Now, there are GMs who really like engaging in systems and being able to engage those systems for all characters, including allies. You totally can do this. I just don't because I feel like it's, it's an opportunity for me to have the allies have an impact, but to move past them quickly, get back to the point, which are the player characters. And if you can do that, then you're in a good, you're in good shape. Also, allies have to have, uh, allies, in order to feel good, allies need to be realized characters in that they, they need to have their own motivations, their own emotions, their own feelings, their own actions, their own deeds, and their own, um, the things that set them apart. So when players want to collect characters for, the, for them to walk around in, they come with baggage. They come with... Uh, they come with stories attached to them, but they're stories designed to let the player characters interact with. Um, I am not that interested in having a session whereby I have a one of their NPC allies saying, there's something that I have to do. I want you to come with me and do it. And then basically spend the entire session with that ally telling the player characters what to do. And at the end of it, the ally progresses in their story. It has to be kind of initiated and driven by the player characters, which does mean that in some ways there are certain traits that are shared by my NPC allies. The first is they will often um, be unable to achieve their goals on their own. If they are able to achieve the goals on their own, then they should not be with player characters. They should just be left behind. Now, why can't they make their achieve their goals on their own? There's a lot of different reasons why. It could be a lack of skill or a lack of talent. It could be a lack of time. It could be a lack of dedication. It could be higher priorities that they need to, to worry about. It could be weaknesses that they have to take into account. But they can't resolve stories on their own because if they could, then they don't actually belong in the player character's story. 
or if they do, then they can't be so closely associated to them as that. Because if their stories just get resolved without the player characters uh, being involved, then they're not kind of as interesting. There's an exception to this though, which is if you uh, offer a story to your players and they reject it, and you decide that you want to let that story progress anyway, that's something that you could potentially do. But in this particular case, what you've done is you've given your players an option and they've decided not to take it. And because they haven't taken it, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, an example of this could be uh, you have a, a prince who is kidnapped and uh, there's uh, and his wife is desperate to go and rescue him and has asked the player characters to help her go and rescue him. And they say no. So she says, okay. And then she goes out and she rescues him and herself. Like you could do that. But the trick is if you're doing that, you have to make sure that your players really aren't interested in that. And you have to make sure that it's important enough that you actually want to see it through. But then there also needs to be probably some kind of consequence to that. Um, happening without the player characters uh, helping out. Why didn't they help out? Was it because they chose not to? Was it because they couldn't? Because they had other things going on? Have that be a part of the story itself. Have characters react to the player characters differently based on what actions they chose to take and what actions they didn't. Uh, but remember that if you offer something to the player characters, they say, no, I won't do it. And then it happens anyway. It can make them feel like they aren't having that much of an effect on the universe around them. So make sure that you take that into account. Um, maybe things don't go as well as they would have had they helped out. Maybe things go catastrophically wrong and now they have to choose whether they want to uh, try again. So these are these are a few things that you can try uh, to, to make it work. And then... Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of how to make allies um, kind of stick with you uh, to make sure that they are not so close but that they are still useful uh, remember the rule of odds so in a group if you have an odd number of people in the group it can help drive the action forward this isn't a hard and fast rule but it is something that is um, that you see applied to in fiction uh, you have one person, one person basically was often does things on their own. Two people, well, when they go out, uh, you can run into a situation where if the two of them disagree with each other, they're at an impasse. They can't necessarily uh, override each other because they both have an equal vote. You have three people and now you have two people who disagree and one person who can side with either side. So it helps get things moving a bit faster. If you have NPC allies, one thing that you could do is by making sure that you add um, an even number. By adding an even number of NPC allies, this means that they can contradict each other, which means that you aren't telling the player characters what to do, you're giving them more than one option. And if they're both allies that they trust, you're emphasizing the fact that your game has uh, dilemmas that they have to consider and that maybe there, there isn't a correct answer or maybe you're, what you're saying is I'd be okay with you doing either of these things because I'm suggesting both courses of action for you I would also say that you are um, that you can have a character uh, present ideas never solutions but ideas and make sure that those ideas can come with twists and, and snags to, to make the player characters start to think about things. They're also like hints. Uh, if you, if your character, if your players are like, we don't know what the fuck to do in this situation. Well, maybe this is the time for you to start saying, okay, well, you can bring out uh, uh, an NPC and the NPC can make some subtle gestures, nudges or hints in order to put them on a track, not necessarily the right track, but on a track, because players who don't know what they're doing, um, or sorry, don't know what to do in that situation, that can start getting to feel like paralysis. And you don't want your players, damn it, come on, there we go. And you don't want your players to feel like paralysis uh, is uh, frustrating for them. You basically want to give them a chance to work things out, and if they don't, then let them move forward anyway, and you can do that with allies. 
Um, but they have to be nudges or hints. It can't be the answer. Do not create a character who you can say like, oh, well, we've got a riddle. And then the that character says, I have the answer. Um, if you're doing that, you're essentially stealing an opportunity for the players to be on top. Uh, they can help, they can hint, but they can't actually solve it themselves. Even if you have, uh, you've presented a riddle and the players are like, I give up. I don't know what the answer is. Resist the urge to have your, uh, to have an ally come up and say, I know the answer. The answer is this, because if that's the case, what you've confirmed to the players are you weren't smart enough to figure out what's happened. Even if you're open about it, even if you're like, I am giving you the answer because this riddle was not, um, because you could not figure out the answer to this riddle, it was too obscure or too difficult, then you're reinforcing that by basically having another character be the one to save the day. Uh, instead, that character can reveal clues in order to let them bridge that gap to make the jump, or that character can suggest a way to circumvent the puzzle, um, possibly at a disadvantage to the party, but at least so that they can keep moving forward. Uh, One of the questions I had worded vaguely in the original question, how do you have the ally NPCs give the players a little nudge in the right direction without being overbearing? Uh, wait, have them wait to be asked is one thing that you can do. Uh, they don't immediately come out and say, it's gotta be this. Uh, have them give those nudges through emotional cues as opposed to intellectual cues. So. Uh, instead of saying, I think that we should enter door number three because of X, Y, and Z, you can have an ally say, I don't know, I feel like door number three just might be the better answer. But that's then it's an emotional choice, and that's basically them kind of giving a little bit of a, a little bit of context. Uh, you can also use an NPC to remind the player characters of something that has occurred uh, to sort of be like, hey, remember when that dragon told us that it really liked marshmallows? Do we have any marshmallows? Um, and in that particular case, what you're suggesting to the players is perhaps one course of action is to procure marshmallows. It's these are these are reminders, but it is not the solution. We can get by the dragon if we have marshmallows, because the instant that you say it like that, you are telling the players the solution. Um, and even if you intend to have your character be wrong, you are still telling the players what to do. And that can feel uh, that can feel wrong because they they are the ones who are supposed to be driving the action. They're the protagonists. Uh, get marshmallows for a dragon. I want to see this plot now. I mean, run it, do it. Just find a way to make it happen. I believe in you. Um, but all of that being said, the, it is a tricky balance, but I do think that you have just burned down the end. I mean, you can, it's a tricky balance. I do think that your, your best bet, um, almost universally when you are running allies is to make sure that they step into the light when players invite them to step into the light. If they don't, they don't need to. Not all the time. That light is designed for the player characters. And if somebody else is stepping into them, it's either by invitation or by necessity. Not because you think it'll be interesting, but because you think that if you don't do it, the players will have a worse time. Focus on them. If you focus on your players and what they need out of the game, uh, you're already ahead because that's what's going to create the best stories is if you are engaging everyone at the table, not everybody at the table wants to engage with my brilliant ideas or stories, because maybe you are an incredible writer or an incredible storyteller, but people have gathered to create a story together and 99 times out of 100, you're going to have a better time if everybody is equally invested and engaged in creating that story. So that's allies. Um, we can cover other parts of allies if if we want, or if there are other questions about allies, please, by all means, um, 
you know, toss them into chat. I'll give you a second for that because I'm then I'm going to uh, cover the second topic of the day. So we'll see if there's other people who have those sorts of answers. I will vamp. Basically just talk for a little bit so that it's not straight dead air while I'm waiting to see if anybody has any very specific things that they need to to bring forward. Um, but it looks like we're okay. All right. Moving on then. Uh, we also had questions about... Um, subversions of expectations or plot twists um so i'm going to cut out the comment in here that specifically references uh things that have happened recently in the game uh and we will throw it in here So this is one thing that I always have trouble with in my games. Either the plot twist is too obvious, or I hide it so much that it seems contrived. I can never pull off a good plot twist, because either my hints are so obvious or so subtle that they would need to really take time to look into. I can't seem to find the happy medium. Okay, so what is a plot twist? A twist is to upend the status quo. Um, some people believe that a twist is necessary in all fiction um, because this, the status quo is there and one needs a twist in order to uh, kick off the rest of the uh, the rest of the plot. Everyone in elementary school, at least when I was going into elementary school and high school, is aware of Freitag's Pyramid, which is the idea of status quo, inciting action, rising action, climax, denouement, and then um, end. But I don't know if you've noticed this, but most stories don't actually follow that. Like, I, I really hate that model. Uh, you could go with the monomyth, you know, the whole the call, the refusal of the call, the goddess, the gifts, the et cetera, the road home. Uh, we're not going to get into that either. What we are going to get into, though, is the concept of um, of twists in a role playing game, because I think that what is being asked right here from Requiem is how do I shock my players by uh, by revealing something, having a big reveal, having a moment that what they thought was a sure thing is not, or by disrupting the universe in a fundamental fashion, but without either making it too subtle or too obvious. So, I uh, first thing I can tell you is if you think you're being too obvious, you may not be. And in some cases, you probably aren't. Remember that when you are crafting a story, you know what's going on. You've seen it from all angles because you're there. You know intrinsically what the answer is. Getting a hint to the solution to a riddle or a puzzle is a delicate art. But a hint, what might seem obvious to you in the moment, may not be obvious because you know the answer already. So if you have, say, established that the killer is wearing a red t-shirt and then you present the cast of characters and then at the end you say, well... It turns out that it was your sister who was wearing a red t-shirt all along. Ah, ha, 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 right? You might think that this is obvious. And in this case, it probably is. But you'd be surprised how easy it is to overlook the hint of the killer was wearing the red t-shirt. One, players forget. They forget all the time. But then when they find out the answer, they're like, Oh, right, you mentioned that the killer was wearing a red t-shirt. Because they didn't necessarily focus on that piece of information right away. They filed it away for future consideration. But how often do you go into your old files? You don't always. So uh, you may not be as obvious as you think. The second is that you want your players to feel clever. It's, it's a balancing act. Uh, but... Uh, it's a balancing act 
here, I'm going to save that question, uh, Dith, because I think that's a really cool one. It's a balancing act when you have, uh, of course, now I forgot my train of thought because <laughs> I saw the question. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, where was I? Right. Letting your players feel smart. Uh, it's it is a it is a strange moment when you um, when I see somebody really emphasize the everything you know is wrong trope that the players are saying I'm convinced that this person person A is the bad guy and then you reveal in the next session person A isn't the bad guy person A is a good guy and they're like oh well that's great so I'll introduce person A to person B who I'm sure is a good guy and then the next session you're like well, no, it turns out person B is the bad guy and has been all along. And then they're like, wow, okay, well, that's two for two that I was wrong. Uh, I think I'm going to go home and think about this. And you're like, going home? Ha, you never had a home to begin with. It was a hologram the entire time. What you're doing is you're basically saying anytime your players say something, they should expect that you might just fuck with them which means that the universe doesn't have uh, a stable core. Its foundation is constantly shifting and it's shifting in a way that feels distinctly unfair. No matter what I believe, it will be wrong, which means that you cannot use twists all the time. And if you have a twist, you've got to be careful with it because if you, if your players guess the twist, you have to think really long and hard before you decide to change the twist so that your players weren't correct. Some of this is born by uh, a writer's wish to appear clever. And writers equate appearing clever by having other people unable to guess what they were trying to do in the first place. That's not really fair. In a role-playing game, a game that is by definition uh, a, a game of communal storytelling, uh, it's unfair because you have control where they do not. And being able to essentially rip that uh, sense of foundation away from players as a way of you exercising your control is not clever. But people fall into the trap and believe that it is. That they're like, well, they could never see that this person who you thought was an ally was going to betray you. It, it's not clever. It is manipulative because unless you've seeded it with hints they would have never had a way to guess and if you didn't seed it with hints it feels arbitrary and if you did seed it with hints then they have a chance to figure it out i'll also point out that people often will say i knew it when they did not know it i knew that this person was going to betray us no you didn't if you knew they were going to betray you, you would have betrayed them first. You would have had them locked up. You would have found the evidence and presented it against them. You would have prevented their betrayal in the first place. So no, you didn't know. You suspected. And suspecting is not the same as knowing. But don't take that moment away from players. Don't point out, hey, you could have done something to prevent this and you didn't. Haha, -ha, you didn't know. Let your players feel smart. Let them feel like they're a little bit ahead of the game. A mystery is only interesting and compelling if there's a chance for the players to solve it. And if there isn't a chance for them to solve it, you're masturbating. You are uh, sitting there basically role-playing with yourself and having other people watch you do it, which is not really what you want. Uh, especially if they figured out a better solution. Yeah, I am not saying you can't change things. I'm not saying that if you've come up with a great idea and you realize that you can make it happen, that you shouldn't do it because it's not what you decided 10 sessions ago. I can be flexible and I can be flexible about big things. If I decide at a point in time that I want somebody to, uh, that I want to change the course of the plot, I can do this if I've planned it correctly. And if I'm also not, destroying foundations. Let's say that I spent 10 sessions suggesting that one character who everyone thought was an ally was actually an enemy. And then I was like, 
Oh, but this would actually be really cool if they were an ally. Okay. Can I justify them being an ally based on the hints that I gave out? And if I can't, but I really want it to happen, I have to spend a whole lot more time seeding that back into the game by making it so that it will make sense that the players could have conceivably figured it out. If you watch a mystery movie and uh, if you watch a mystery movie and you guess who the killer is, fantastic. You feel great. If you watch a mystery movie and you don't guess who the killer is, but when the clues are revealed, you're like, I could have caught that, but I didn't. That's cool. Fantastic. If you see a murder mystery or murder movie and you don't guess who the killer is because there was absolutely no way for you to know who the killer was, you're not actually watching a mystery movie. You're watching a thriller or a, or a, uh, uh, like a suspense film or a horror film. Because if there was no way for you to know, if there was legitimately no way for you to figure it out, the point of the movie is not the mystery. Because if the point of the movie is the mystery, it has to be solvable. Or at the very least, there has to be a reasonable expectation that you could have guessed what the answer is. So, don't worry about being too obvious. Now, obviously you don't want to be so obvious that it ruins a surprise, but definitely don't focus too much on what if I'm being too obvious. Your players aren't necessarily going to pick up on everything because the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you're putting an appropriate density of information and hints to your players. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you have a player who might be somebody who will betray you. Well, if in a game session, the only information you give your players of note are, here are the three things that this character is doing that is that are suspicious, they're gonna know. And it won't be interesting because essentially all you're doing is saying this person is suspicious and you should suspect them. But if you give them three clues that they're suspicious, five clues that are neutral, and one clue to lead them off the tra trail, well, now you've actually give them, given them nine things to process, three of which say this person's worthy of suspicion, five of which which say this person is normal, and one of which says this person is somebody who you should protect. Now, because you've increased the density of information that you've given, it's less obvious that your obvious hints are the things that they should be paying attention to, because they could be paying attention to everything. Uh, it's, and also try to spread that information out among multiple characters. So yeah, this character does something, something suspicious, but then also three other characters have done some, some things that could also be considered suspicious, but they've also all done things that could be considered normal. Well, now you have players who are trying to figure things out, but they can't immediately start panicking and thinking that the entire world is out to get them unless they're paranoid, which if they are, that's a specific problem that you should be addressing because Remember, if all your player characters ever find is that people betray them, eventually they'll stop trusting everybody. Um, you Red herrings are really interesting if they are accompanied by uh, actual important information. Because if you say you've done a 20 story, sorry, a 20 chapter arc in a story and it turns out that you were wrong the entire time, well then players might look back and be like, oh man, we spent 20 sessions doing this and it didn't matter. Fuck. Now, I'm not saying that that's impossible to pull off and have it be a, a great experience for your players, but it is difficult for you to be able to do so in a way that's going to feel really good. Uh, but uh, red herrings uh, can be useful. Let's take the, the betrayer, right? Uh, if I have a character who is a betrayer, let's say that that character is like, look, I hate magic users and I wish that they were all dead. And that's the reveal that you want, right? Um, but then you have at one point that character uh, donates to uh, a wizard who's down on her luck. Well, that's a red herring, but you can justify it by saying, well, no, I hate magic users, but this person, I have a very specific 
uh, reason why I'd want to support this person because despite the fact that they're a filthy magic user, uh, they're also orphans and I am an orphan and so therefore I have some uh, sympathy for orphans and I'm hoping that they might just stop using magic uh, later on, right? There's, there's a lot of things that you can do, but the... The thing is about a red herring is that it should be presented as something that's interesting for the players to interact with and deal with, and it should also be presented alongside other information as well. If it's the only thing that you present and it's a red herring, all you've done is deliberately mislead the players in a way that they could not see, there's no way that they could have prevented it, and if you then later on punish the players for being wrong, what you've actually done is you've punished the players for listening to you. Don't do that. Uh, Requiem asks, is it worth it to more or less let the players figure out the twist from time to time? Yes, absolutely, 100%. Let your players feel smart. If they figured it out and they're like, okay, we think we know who the traitor is in our group and they go forward and they accuse that person of being the traitor and they present their evidence and they're like, ha 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 ha, we saw through the GM's evil plans. If your players are laughing and they're feeling great about it, you just won. Congratulations. No, you don't get to have that big reveal where your players are like, oh my god, I how I I didn't see that coming. No, you don't get to have that. But instead, you get to give your players the satisfaction of knowing that they've done something super cool. They figured out a mystery. They're the detectives. They get to be Sherlock Holmes. They get to be the person who outwits you. And that's also really valuable. Would we like Sherlock Holmes if he was always wrong? No. Part of the reason why we like Sherlock Holmes is because he's right. And we're like, wow, he figured it out when no one else could. Give your players that feeling. Let them feel awesome. That is a cool moment. Uh, so, yeah. Absolutely. Let them figure out the twist from time to time. And also, if they figure out the twist, then you know that the next time you have to make it a little bit harder for them to figure it out. You can calibrate your own storytelling by seeing what your players react to and what they don't. Um, but don't don't give in to that, uh, that selfish urge of, I want to be right all the time, and for me to be right, others must be wrong. That's not better. You're not actually doing yourself a favor there. Uh, it is really gratifying when you can pull wool over people's eyes and you pull it off and they're like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yes, totally. It is super fun. I've done it many times to my players and they appreciate it. At least I hope they do. But I also give them moments where they get to be right, where they get to figure it out, where they get to win, where they get to... Uh, and sometimes they believe in something so deeply and they come up with reasons why it could be true that I love it so much that I let them be right even if it wasn't what I was originally intending. Now, all of this is a balancing act. You want to do this when it makes for the best story and for when your players are going to feel good about what just happened. But you don't want to do this... Uh, you don't want to, to change plots uh, if it then feels like, well, no matter what, uh, we can't necessarily affect the outcome. Or alternately, no matter what, we're going to be right is also not something that you want. Or no matter what, no whatever we decide, the GM's going to arbitrarily decide whether we're right or wrong at the moment that we've made that decision. So all the setup is worthless. Don't do that either. But if you have somebody who's like, I'm going to betray you, I'm going to betray you, I'm going to betray you. And then the players are like, yes, they could be a betrayer, but here's why they could possibly be uh, a traitor. This is why we... Like, maybe they're just misled and we can put them back on the path of good. Like, fucking let them do that. Your players have just told you the story they want to tell. Listen to them. If you listen to your players, you're going to get better stories out of it. If you listen to what they say, they are typically saying what they want to see. In much the same way that if they put something on their character sheets, probably it's because it's something that they want to see in-game. If they put a cult on their character sheet... It is not very often that somebody's going to put a cult four on their character sheet and then say, I hate the occult and I hope it never shows up. The only reason I'm buying a cult is so that my character knows how to deal with it because I hate dealing with it so much. Very, very rare that you're going to see that, if at all, if ever. 
But if somebody's putting a cult four on their sheet, it means that they want to see that occult. Bring it in. If you want to, that is, obviously. Uh, if your players voice aloud their wishes for how the game is going to go, if those wishes can be accommodated, and it sounds like an interesting story to you, if you would also like to see that happen, go ahead and do it. Go for it. Your twist is not more important than you having a good time and everybody having a good time. Um, I hate those series. Paranoia breeds murder hobos. Paranoia always breeds murder hobos. You're absolutely correct. Uh, hate series that ends with, and it was all a dream. Uh, it was all a dream is most of the time an excuse to get yourself out of a corner that you've painted yourself into. And sometimes it's best to, instead of saying it was all a dream, just stop the game for a second, look your players in the eye and say, I fucked up and we got to rewind. We got to retcon. Do that. Don't cheat them out of things by saying it was all a dream. <laughs> Unless you're playing Change on the Dreaming, in which case, fuck, it is all a dream. Go for it. Uh, the main reason I love Red Herrings is because if they catch traction, I can expand it into a full plot. Yeah. But like that to me, a Red Herring. So the definition, if we're. So if we're looking at the definition of a Red Herring. A red herring is especially a clue that is intended to be misleading or distracting. So putting something that is distracting, and if your players are like, oh, this is more interesting, I don't want to deal with that, great, follow along with it. Putting something that is deliberately misleading is a problem if you don't give players an equal opportunity to discover the things that aren't misleading. Because if all you do is mislead your players all the time, then they will stop believing everything you say. And you only have yourself to blame. So, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, so Dith asked a question a while ago, which I, I want to get to. Um, how can you get all players equally invested if, for example, one player is way better in guessing than others? Uh, you have to find out what your players are actually invested in. What gets them invested in something? Because not every player is going to be invested in mystery. Not everybody wants to f figure out the, the answer to a mystery. Sometimes what they want is to be surprised and shocked. Sometimes what they want is for somebody else to come up with the answer. But if you have players who all want to be the ones to have the aha moments, and at the same time only one of them ever gets to do it and the others feel like they're they're not guessing the answer, is, well, you have a couple of ways that you can go about it. Um, one way is you can retroactively have another character be right. Now again, this is an advanced maneuver and it is not one that I necessarily recommend for you to do all the time and it is definitely not something that you wanna get caught doing if you're doing it. But if all of your players come up with different answers that are equally plausible, you can have it be that one of the players who hasn't been right typically is right in that moment. You can do that, that is okay. There isn't a, a hard and fast rule that says that all of your plot has to be written in stone and you cannot change it because otherwise players are going to hate you. But you have to make sure that their answer is supported. You have to make sure that there are answers as to why they are correct and why the others are not. So if you have spent, uh, if, if you have spent the whole time having one character do things and all of your hints say this character is the bad guy, and then this one person says, well, maybe they're the good guy, but there's nothing to back that up. And then at the end, you're like, yep, they were the good guy all along. Uh, that's unsupported. So what you can do is delay the reveal until it is supported, until you can give evidence to support that player's claims. Um, the, the real trick is to be patient and to know when you can spring a surprise. And if the moment isn't correct, you can wait. You still have to make sure that your players are engaged and invested in other ways and give them interesting things to do to follow along. Because if a mystery lasts forever, then it looks like it'll never get solved. They'll stop caring about solving it. But you can delay and introduce new facts to support a different story if that's what you think will make for a better moment. If you really think that one of the players needs to be wrong, instead of having a reveal and being like, ha, you were wrong the entire time. Instead, you start hinting that they're wrong. You start introducing information that causes them to cast doubt on their previous suspicions. 
if you, for instance, have a character who has an intimacy of, uh, I am, uh, I am, uh, you know, I support the king in everything that he does. And they're like, great, this person absolutely supports the king in everything that they do. And you're like, oh shit, no, I, I, I don't want them to necessarily do that. Then you start poking holes in that theory. Have them be like, yes, I support you, king. But then like goes off and gets drunk afterwards. Well, why is this person getting drunk? And then you find out this person's getting drunk because they're like, I, I must serve my king. I will do what my king commands. But like, man, it's getting harder and harder to do that. Well, now you've started to seed some doubt. Maybe this person isn't as loyal as you once thought they were. So, but that takes time. But it's way better for you to seed that doubt and let the players come to that conclusion than to outright tell them you were wrong. It turns out that you were wrong the whole time. Let them figure it out. Because the other thing is that a good twist, a good twist is the players are the ones who say the twist out loud. I can't believe that this person was this the whole time. Better than you saying, fools, I was this the whole time. Right? If you wanted to have a reveal where it turns out that somebody who you thought was red was actually green this whole time, describe them in such a way that the players are the ones who say, but you're green. You can describe that they've got like a... Uh, well, they have a, a forest hue. They have, uh, they smell of, of grass instead of cinnamon. They, yes, everybody knows what you're talking about. Everybody can guess if you're not saying outright, this person is green, but let them make that final leap. Let them say it out loud. Let them be the ones to be like, this person is the traitor. This person is, uh, a different faction that I once thought they were. This person is uh, the is the chosen one that we've been looking for this entire time. Let them say it because if you say it, you're robbing that moment from the players. It might feel like it isn't that big a deal. Your players might not even realize that it's that big a deal, but it is. It is totally important, totally important to let your players be the one to bridge the final gap. Even if that gap is only millimeters wide, if they're the ones to make the connection, it will resonate with them way more than if you're the one who makes the connection, you tell them what the connection is. If it's time to make the reveal, you're basically giving them hints that are so obvious that it is impossible not to make that uh, realization right away. Uh, the person is standing above the king holding a bloody knife and twisting it into the king's side is way more evocative because then the players are like, no, you were the tra traitor the whole time. Then for you to say, uh, okay, you walk in and it turns out that uh, Alex is the traitor because Alex is stabbing the king. Don't say that. Like you immediately, you can hear it in, in what I say. The instant that I say, it turns out Alex is the traitor because this it feels a lot less effective than my saying this happens and you're the ones who figured it out. That's a, a it's a subset of showing and not telling. Um, and it's one of those things that you got to do for a mystery. Do not have like have a player character make that realization. Even if by then they realize that everyone else knows, let them be the one to say it. Um, it is a great way to up your players engagement even if they're not the ones who came up with the solution, right? Like if another player says, uh, I figured it out, here is my guess. And you're worried that the other players might be disappointed because they're not the ones who made the guess. Let them also make tiny connections before you go off and, con and confirm. Because if they are instrumental in bridging that gap, they're invested. If they just are there when you tell them that the gap no longer exists, they're not going to be as invested as they could be. Uh, which is, which is a thing. Uh, Saren Zero. Oh boy. Featured chat. I love you, but you're not always, uh, perfect. Unfortunately, 
Um, Seren Zero pointing out that if players are kind of moderately interested in the main quest, they introduce a few rumors that you don't plan on actually panning out, but they turn out to be super invested in finding the Wondrous MacGuffin. Maybe the quest for the Wondrous MacGuffin is the story that wants to be told. Yes, but that's less about like a red herring deliberately misleading somebody from a mystery. And that's more a distraction that somebody follows along. I totally get it because they are technically both red herrings. But I think that red herrings um, in the context of this discussion is when you are deliberately misleading characters as opposed to distracting them. Uh, so Kung Fu Fenris, it's technically red herrings are both. They're a distraction or an attempt to mislead um, by definition. So I think that you're you're both using different definitions. Um, so I think you're actually both correct, but you're uh, but the, the it's just nomenclature that we're getting caught up on. Um, so Requiem says there is also the chance that the players, if they are really invested in the NPC, to see the betrayal and watch them try to rationalize it. So uh, I the reason why I've been saying betrayal is partially because I do not want to comment on reveals that may or may not have happened in my games because I don't want people to like be spoiled, especially if they were very recent. Um, but uh, betrayal is one of those things that is a twist. It's a common twist. It is a twist that you got to be very careful with. Betrayals feel better for players if there are definitely hints that they can see to explain it before the betrayal causes too much damage. It's not saying that the betrayal can't cause damage. It totally can. It can even be catastrophic. But it feels better for the players if they can at least have felt like that there was something wrong. Because if everything was perfect and then all of a sudden something goes bad, that's whiplash, that's emotional whiplash, and that's dangerous. But it also undermines confidence in the world's foundation. And once you undermine confidence in the world's foundation, players no longer trust you. And if they don't trust you, because they're no longer trusting that you are doing things in an interest of making the story right, and instead are potentially doing things in an attempt to mislead them, that's when you're going to run into some issues. So... Uh, don't have the wedding where everything is going great and then have the bride stab the groom unless you've made it possible for the players to either guess that the bride was going to stab the groom or at least put the players in a situation where they felt unease like something could go wrong because what players really want is to have moments of my emotions were correct not necessarily I figured it out but my gut feeling is something that I can trust because that feels good. Um, even if your gut feeling is, you know, everything's too perfect, something's something's going to go bad, something, something wrong is going to happen, that's better than saying everything's perfect. What could possibly go wrong? And genuinely believing that and then having something wrong happen. So that's a, uh, that is a situation that you want to, uh, that you want to avoid. Herring is supposed to be pickled and eaten, not placed in plot. Uh, I think that part of that is because a good red herring is one that you don't necessarily remember as a red herring. You don't remember it as something that's awful. Uh, okay, so here's an interesting uh, way to look at it as well. So Brain Torn Out says another way to do betrayal is to escalate it. From some previous experience, I found that players also react in a good way if betrayal starts off screwing them over in a small way, but it gets more and more difficult over time. Yes, uh, because this is a way for them to develop the emotional attachment that then they can feel like they're acting on. Um, emotional attachment is what you is what you want, because emotional attachment is still believing in the fundamental principles of the universe that you've created, um, as opposed to I have no idea what's going on. If a player ever says, I have no idea what's going on, it's often a danger sign. It's not necessarily a red flag, but it's a yellow one. Um, I have no idea what's going on. It can indicate I'm giving up on trying to figure out what's happening. And if your players are giving up, they're removing themselves emotionally from the game because they don't want to feel like they are uh, useless or that they are stupid um and the way that we protect ourselves is to make ourselves emotionally distant that is 
the core defense mechanism for uh, life itself. You uh, you don't want to be in, in your relationship anymore. Well, uh, a lot of people start before they like pull the plug and break up with the other person. They start disconnecting emotionally first because they don't want that pain of being like, well, now I'm leaving a relationship that I want to be in and I'm leaving and I'm hurting this person who I care about. So instead they start convincing themselves that they don't care about that person that much. They start convincing themselves that they'd be happier if they weren't in a relationship. They start finding reasons why it would be a good idea to break up beyond the ones that are prompting them originally. And once they've prepared themselves, that's when they drop the bomb. It's also why a lot of people won't do things like break up with somebody on their birthday or on a major holiday because they feel like that would be um, harder to disconnect emotionally if you added extra hurt. Because let's face it, when you do something, it's for yourself. You might think that it is unselfish, but being unselfish is by its very nature, if you look at it in a certain way, selfish. I wouldn't break up with my partner on their birthday because that would be cruel. Yes, it's because you do not want to be cruel. It is not because the world would be better off if you if that cruelty didn't exist. It's that you don't want to be cruel or you don't want to be seen as cruel or you don't want to have that emotional impact that of that. So this is, uh, don't worry about it, Brian, uh, brain torn out about grammar. Do not worry about it. Uh, it's uh, look, I, I stream after work and I'd recognize it for our European friends, our African friends, our Asian friends, our uh, Oceania friends. It's not necessarily the best time. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you're escalating a betrayal, what you're doing is you are getting your players emotionally invested in the betrayal instead of disconnected from the betrayal. Disconnecting is not what you want because with disconnection comes lack of interest and lack of investment. Uh, Requiem points out though there is a difference between someone throwing up their hands and going, I don't know what's happening and being like, hey, I don't know what's going on, but I'm loving it and can't wait to see how it all fits together. Yes, there is an absolute difference of that. But this is part of the reason why at the end of my sessions, I ask my players what they learned because if they cannot answer, it means that they are not having a good time. It means they're disconnecting um, because if it was your ladder, then when they say, you know what I learned today, I learned that I don't know what's going on. Uh, I, I learned that my my theories are incorrect and, and maybe maybe things are going to go great. Maybe things are going to go bad, but I, I can't wait to see what happens next. That's one way. But if they're like, I don't know what I learned. I, I just don't. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. That is means there's a problem and i'm not saying that a problem there is like your game is doomed you failed or even that the session was bad or even that the player isn't having fun but if a player cannot say i this is what i learned it's a bad sign and if a player is saying i don't know what's happening and genuinely is just like i don't know what's happening i i i don't know what's happening it's something for you to be aware of because people do not want to stay in a state of I don't know for too long. It doesn't feel good. It's sort of like if you were watching a mystery movie and then before the reveal, you stopped the tape and you were like, yep, there it is. And if they're like, I, I don't know what the answer is, then they're going to be upset. And then eventually they're just going to be like, well, I don't care anymore. And they're going to stop caring about the movie because they realize that they're not going to get the satisfaction they want. Even if then after an extended period of time, you give them the answer, they're going to be like, well, you may like, I have spent way too long being annoyed and frustrated and pissed about this, that now I don't care. Even if you tell me what's the answer, that's what you want to avoid. That's absolutely what you want to avoid. Brain Torn Out says that aiming for that sweet spot is great from time to time, but doing it too much will just make your campaign way too convoluted. Yes, and it is why I also point out that betrayal has to be something that you do with very careful, uh, with a very careful touch, and you cannot do it that often. If your players become paranoid, it is quite likely that it's because you made them paranoid. 
they deserve to be paranoid because everything that they've believed has been wrong consistently. And whose fault is that? It is, in fact, yours. Um, so you got to be careful. Um, twists. Really avoid the urge to have too many twists um, and avoid the urge to have too many twists and have them collide. Right. Um, because if if it feels like every session, something a, a huge twist is occurring, it can be exhausting. Maybe your players are up to it. Maybe you're up to it. But be careful. Because if it feels too convoluted, eventually people are just going to be like, well, fucking forget it. If you remember the old television series 24, 24 was uh, a show that relied on cliffhangers. What's going to happen next? Um, it's the Da Vinci Code of television shows, right? Uh, the Da Vinci Code and and the all Dan Brown books have chapters that are two pages long. And the book is printed in such a way that it's just like, okay, well, you've turned the page and the end of the chapter, and you'll never believe what happened next. Like the whole book is clickbait. And 24, to a large part, was also clickbait. It basically was like, well, now this crazy shit's happened. What's going to happen next? Like it escalated and escalated and escalated and escalated. But they always made sure to, to not become too convoluted. A show that did become too convoluted was Lost. Crazy shit kept happening, but they kept not having an answer for that crazy shit. So eventually it was just so much mystery that you were like, forget it. I don't care anymore. Whereas in 24, they would load things onto you and then you'd be like, oh, wow, this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But then some things would get resolved so that you didn't have to have your emotional investment spread so thin. Uh, so actually, no, let's let's uh, let's go for another another question here. Saren Zero on a slightly different note. When I have the time, how do I go about picking a setting or getting people invested in a setting without giving too much away too much of the plot? So if you're asking me personally, I don't develop the setting too hard. I come up with a basic idea. I put it out there and then I see what the players do with it. I see how they run with it. And then I, I adapt to what they are interested in. I don't do too much planning, but that's my GM style. Uh, I don't like to do too much planning in advance because I like to run with players and that's not better. It's just the way I do things. It's just different. There are advantages to it and there are absolutely disadvantages to it too. Um, but how do I go about picking a setting? I talk with my players. I say, this is what I'm interested in. What are you interested in? Or I say first, what are you interested in? Okay. Well, given that this is what I'm interested in. Um, or I, uh, I pitch a setting to them and then I see how they feel about it, but I actually listen to them. I don't pitch a setting. And then if they're like, well, I could maybe make that work. And I'm like, great. You said maybe, and then move forward. I listen to their concerns. I find out what they're looking for. I find out what they want. And it does change over time. Uh, for instance, I was really looking forward to running a changeling, the lost LARP, uh, and then at one point I was like, oh no, uh, uh, we've been trying to organize this, but we can't get, we, we just, we couldn't get everybody to, to commit to a time, uh, specifically the GMs couldn't necessarily commit to a time together. Uh, it was getting long to figure it out. And I was also noticing that, you know, there were some various issues that were cropping up. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm starting to feel not so great about this, but this was all overcomable. And then COVID struck. And now I have zero interest in running Changing the Lost. Not because I'm worried about the logistics of the game, but because I'm like, I just don't want to deal with uh, uh, Changeling the trauma-ing after this, after what is essentially endurance that we're all suffering right now, where we have to be isolated from the people who we care about. It just isn't a game that I want to play right now. But that doesn't mean that Changing the Lost is a bad game. And it doesn't mean that I might not want to play it again in the future. But right now, fuck no and probably not for a long time after this. Running a LARP where I'm like, yep, all of you just had to be isolated and now you're together again could be really interesting, but it's not a game that I'm interested in playing. So I'm allowed to change my feelings about settings and I think that other people will inevitably do that too. So that's kind of where I'm at in terms of uh, choosing setting. Uh, but yeah, I choose a setting and I do it in conjunction with my players and then I do not define it rigidly so that I can find out what my players are into and then I go with what they do. That's my answer. But I freely invite everyone to give their answers as well because there's definitely some advantages to 
crafting a huge universe that then you then present to the players and they get really invested in it right away. But it's just a different style of game. One that I haven't done in a while. Again, maybe I will do it at some point in the future. Just not right now. Uh, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm not running Changing the Lost. Uh, not for a while anyway. Uh, Brain Turnout says the only place where having a, lots of, a lot of twists feels appropriate is if a chunk of the current chapter in the campaign is related with politics. The players need to be in the right mindset though because players are not always up to following a mess of tangled motives and schemes. Uh, I would say that you just have to be careful about spacing the twists out and you also have to accept that they may not all have the same emotional impact. One person ends up being part of a faction they don't expect, huge moment. The second time someone ends up being part of a faction they don't expect, don't expect that to have the same impact. It's okay. It's all right. It's it's just fine. Um, I, I wouldn't worry. Um, but it's not necessarily politics. The thing is, twists come with a certain kind of game. If you're playing a game where people just kick down the door, kill monsters, steal their treasures, and then go on, uh, they're not necessarily looking for any twists, and twists may not be appropriate. Um, if you're playing a game where people are like, okay, well, I'm interested in a little bit of intrigue, but not that much because of what I really want to do is just go on adventures and feel like a superhero. Okay, cool. A big twist might be appropriate. You see those in superhero movies all the time, but they have like one, you know, like, oh, it turns out this guy who was a good guy is actually a bad guy. Yep. There's a twist. Great twist to throw in there, but you don't want it to be like, this person's a bad guy and this person who you thought was a bad guy is a good guy. And that person has these motivations and this person has these motivations. That's a political thriller, but it doesn't necessarily have to be politics, but you have to see that your players are in the mood for that. You have to see that they're wanting intrigue and intrigue. Um, remember that twists also don't have to be huge. It could be, Oh, this person's acting kind of suspicious. And then it turns out that they are acting suspicious in this particular fashion. Huh? I didn't know that before. What a twist. Okay, great. And it doesn't have to be that this person who you thought was an amazing person ends up being the literal embodiment of evil in the world. Uh, it doesn't have to be that big. It doesn't have to be that big a deal. So, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, so yeah, um, so there is something that I wanted to bring up just in our last little bit, because it was a question that had been posed to me and it's something that I don't think I'm going to have a full answer for right away. Uh, but it is something that I, I definitely wanted to talk about. And this is something that I'm going to bring up as I am talking about this, not knowing the answer. I don't have the answer to this. I have thoughts, but I definitely don't have answers and I want to hear your opinions on it. Because I don't, I don't, I don't think I've fully formed my opinion, and I kind of want to know what people think about it. Because this was brought on by the introduction of a tweet where someone said, "So I'm looking to get rid of the term. Uh, I don't like the the term game master and what it implies. So what are your alternate terms to describe that person?" And that person is totally within the rights to be like, I don't want to call somebody a game master. That's totally cool. No problems there. You can call whatever you want. You can say that a person is this title or that title. Great, whatever. But there were a couple of people who responded saying that the term game master was outright offensive and no one should use it. And it made me think about, well, is that true or is that not true? Um, because it was based on the idea that uh, the ideas of, of comparing masters and slaves. Uh, in computer terminology, master-slave is used a lot, but there is now a, a deliberate push, a push that's actually supported by a lot of large companies, including Microsoft through GitHub, uh, where that terminology is going to be out of date. There, it's no longer going to be used because there's no real need to bring up master-slave when there are other ways that you can call a uh that type of relationship between uh two kinds of uh uh two kinds of data right or processes or devices <clears throat> but there are uh there are concerns about that terminology specifically because it references slaves um uh, I don't know what you mean by idiotic. The the idea about game master being offensive, or the idea of, um, 
or the idea of master slave for terminology in, in terms of technology. Because I definitely agree that there's no reason to use master slave at this point um, because that's just referring to awful things. Uh, using things like uh, there's master standby, there's master minion, um, there's examples of primary secondary or controller or agent or uh, master and puppet because you don't need to use slave specifically. But in terms of game master, uh, game master to me, the, the reason why I was thinking about this is because you can look at the idea that a game master, uh, one of the definitions of master and one of the definitions of master is a slave owner. And even slave owner is now, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a term that's coming under question because it could be, end up being, uh, more like a, uh, uh, a slave driver because the idea of ownership, like, does anybody actually truly own somebody? But this is a topic that's beyond the scope of what I'm talking about. Um, because there's uh, a master is also somebody who is in control because I think that that's really what separates a game master from the players is the level of control that somebody has. The game master is the facilitator of the game. I'm here to control how the game is paced and where it goes. Um, uh, linguistic drift is one thing and master has a lot of different meanings. Master also means a master of a craft. Absolutely. Which is why I, I, I don't think I agree with the idea that game master is an offensive term. I don't think it is. But I definitely think that there are times where you wouldn't necessarily want to use the term game master. There are some games where they come up with their own ideas for what uh, the uh, game master should be called. And oftentimes I use those. When I refer to myself when I'm running uh, a world of darkness game or a storyteller system game i call myself the storyteller i don't call myself the game master i'm the storyteller because that's what it is that's how it's defined in game and i like the term storyteller um and no before people complain about like but isn't everybody telling the story yeah but everybody is assisting in telling the story it's i am telling you a story and you are then taking that story and running with it and doing things with it i'm the one who is controlling and, and moving um, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, your title is Dungeon Master. And aside from getting that kind of cute little tickle of, ooh, maybe we're making reference to the idea that somebody is a Dungeon Master, uh, it's that's how that game chooses to define itself. And that's fine. Game leader. So then it comes into terminology of how separate is the Game Master from other players? Because game leader to me i would not like to use that because that would imply that i am the leader of our group and whether i am or not i don't like the automatic implication that anybody who is running a game is ostensibly that game's leader or like that group's leader uh although in some definitions it's absolutely true i've heard one of my favorite definitions for leader is a leader is the person answering the questions so if somebody doesn't know what they do, they ask, and the leader is the one who answers. If someone says, how do I do this? The leader says, this is how you do it. You are in that moment leading that other person. Um, but it, there's also some uh, connotations to leader, which I'm uncomfortable with because it makes it seem like, oh yeah, I have been elevated above the players. I am, um, I am the, like I can tell them what to do and I don't want to say I can tell them what to do. I can control the environment that they're in and I can adjudicate their actions, but I don't want to tell them what to do. So, um, yes. So <laughs> I want to say that game manager. Uh, so here's the thing. I, I, I am absolutely true uh it's absolutely true what kate is saying that as far as i know uh here let me actually just bring it up why for some reason i oh because i i did that that's fine uh so kate says as far as i know we and much of our viewer base don't have the ancestral ties to being slaves so it's not our place to say oh yeah this terminology is fine so I will also say that if somebody comes to me and says, I don't want, like in this game, could you not refer to yourself as game master? I just don't like the term master. It makes me feel uncomfortable. Then I could be like, you know what? Okay, cool. 
I don't mind making that accommodation for you. That's fine. I can't make that accommodation for the entire world in all things because somebody could basically come up to me and say anything I say could potentially be wrong and therefore I can't do it. So I can't please everybody. But if I'm running a small group and that one person in that group is like, look, I really don't like this term. I'm definitely going to go with that. That's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, but uh, it, I'm talking about the universal name for a game master. And I actually don't necessarily think I have a problem with the idea of game master. Um, yeah, it's a context matters moment because uh, there's because you could also say equally, I don't think people should be called games master because that's in English and English is the language of the oppressors because it fucking is. Uh, but again, like, are we going to go that far? Is that the distance that we're going to go? Is that what we're going to do? Like, it gets to be a tricky situation. But it did make me think um, this debate about what we call a game master. Um, so, Kate, when you say, I think that it does put the GM above the players, what puts the GM above the players? Sorry, I just, because there's a delay in um, inherent in Twitch, uh, I don't necessarily know what you're referring to. The term game master. Okay. Um, they don't always know more than some of their players. So the way that I would define master is controller and controller is absolutely the case. I do believe that the GM is has more control than the players. And in fact, that's part of what you're doing. Your job is to control and the players want you to be in control because they are taking actions and they want to see what those actions do. But in order to know what those actions do, one of the players is actually saying, this is what happens when you do this. It's because they have the control. They're the game master. Um, and it is something that I am struggling with consistently uh, is this idea that um, who is most important at the gaming table? Is the GM, how other is the GM? Um, if the task was created a generic term to replace game master to better suit the diversity of games available today, I don't necessarily have uh, one. Uh, judge, judge feels a bit like, first of all, I'm going to say like, I'm going to see problems in all terms, including game master. So if I'm coming up with like objections to your term, it's not because I think that you're dumb or that you're, that you should be taken out of hand. Thing is judge. I don't want to be like, I don't want to make it seem like I am judging the actions. I'm not there being like, yes, you have pleased me. And so I give you this and you have not. So I do not give that like, and I'm also not necessarily judging um, the value of your actions, but you know, it's, it's tough stuff. Arbiter. I don't like my role being reduced to referee. I am the referee, but it feels like it takes away from a lot of what I put into a game. If I, if my title is essentially you get to adjudicate the rules. Um, narrator. So uh, narrator makes some sense. Narrator is actually the term that Mind's Eye Theater uses for uh, people who are on the storytelling team but are not storytellers themselves. Uh, yeah, Master of Ceremonies. Uh, so no dice. Yep. Uh, because I, I will also say that as much as I I really don't like, and I'm the one who brings this up a lot, I don't like the idea of saying that the game master is um, the game master is in charge or the game master is in is more important than the players. But in, in some very real senses, the game master is different and it carries a certain importance and privilege and weight and responsibility to the players. Um, and, and as much as I also say that it's everybody's job to make sure that everyone's having a good time at the table, not just the game masters. Uh, I also believe that, uh, it is the game master while the game master enjoys the privilege of being in control. It is also their responsibility that they're in control. And I think that it's dangerous to take away too much from the game master's role. If that's what they are truly doing in the game. There's some games in which the game master has very little 
to worry about, very little to contribute, right? Uh, in good society, the Game Master is known as the facilitator in some ways, or at least was when we played it, but that's because Liz wasn't like making that many calls. We were basically describing it as we were uh, for ourselves and she was facilitating things moving along. So her title of facilitator was perfect, but not in the kind of game that uh, I'm doing. Uh, like I could not just be a facilitator for Exalt Witch. Uh, my role is different. And I, and I get worried that if people start diluting the role of Game Master too much, uh, then it will end up being um, a shame for certain kinds of games. For certain games, it's absolutely true. And, and for those games, I don't think you should use the term Game Master at all if you are just a facilitator. Just a facilitator. If that is your role. It's like the equivalent of being banker in Monopoly, right? You're the banker, yes, but like you're not, you're you're a player, just like all the other players. The difference is that you also just happen to be the one to handle the money. It doesn't give you any real special power. It just gives you uh, a, a responsibility that you have to take out. And you have the privilege of being the one who gets to touch the bills. But for other games, I don't want to take away that feeling that the Game Master has a, a different role. Game crafter, that's a way of that's that's something that you could potentially look at. The idea that you're building something that other people are, are dealing with. Game knave, I like it. Um Yeah, I, I don't like so director, I've seen director used for games like Hong Kong Action Theater, which is specifically the conceit is you're on a movie set, so like that's a bit different. Um uh, so Brain says, there is no real good turn to replace Game Master or Dungeon Master even. I don't think anybody can come up with a term as easy to understand or as catchy as it. As it. People may try, but in my opinion, it will come down to these two reasons. Ease of understanding and catchiness. Uh, I get worried when someone says, because it's easy, that's what should be done. Um, because that's a way to basically shut down a lot. Uh, it's easy only because it's what we're used to. And we've been calling things game masters for decades, so it's very easy to say, and it's it's instantly understandable. And I do agree that you gotta have a compelling reason to change something in order to change it. And I'm not convinced that there is a compelling reason to change the generic term for this role in role-playing from game master. But I don't think that it's enough to say, just because it's easy doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Um, I think storyteller is a great term and I use it, like I said, a lot. It is how I identify if somebody asked like, what are you? I'm the storyteller. I'm the storyteller in these games because a lot of the games that I run are, are storyteller system games. It makes it easy, but I'd also be tempted to call myself the storyteller in other games as well, depending on the game. Um, and I don't think the storyteller is necessarily a problem either, right? Dungeon keeper, games keeper, um, so Mangani says I do have that heritage and I feel it's important to change language to move forward and be more inclusive of the people in this hobby so like right there that's somebody who has a better say on this than I do right uh, immediately that's something that I should be paying attention to now one person isn't necessarily going to be enough to change the in like to, to change things, but that that voice is one that carries with it uh, some importance and weight that we should be listening to. And so if you don't like the term um, game master, it's also very easy for me to say, it, it's like the equivalent, I mean, like this is also the danger that gets into it. This is probably a larger topic than just the, the end of clinic hours, but, uh, I can't count how many times somebody was like, oh yeah, no, like I use gay as an insult, but it's not, I'm not calling them homosexual. I'm calling them gay. Gay just means different things. Language evolves. And I don't think that that's, that doesn't excuse it, right? Yes, language does evolve, but as long as you have that, as long as people react to the language in that way, you can't then claim to be above it all uh, fully, right? I, uh, I, you know, my, my situation, uh, is that I am, uh, 
remarkably vanilla. I am a white Anglo-Saxon, uh, white Anglo-Saxon, cisgendered, heterosexual male. <laughs> so, you know, it's very easy for me to say things because everybody has in the past listened to me. So, uh, yeah, Puka Jusu's point. Oh, sorry, it's a butter knife. Uh, and then you hold up toast. Like, no, you're not allowed to just say that language has moved on just because you want it to. And it's also, you're not allowed to say that a word shouldn't hurt somebody just because you want to keep using it. Um, and this is why I wanted to bring it up because as much as I can say game master to me means controller and therefore I don't think that it is offensive because master also has many different definitions um, and these definitions are uh, are ones that we can't necessarily ignore. And I'm also against the idea that uh, anytime any word at any point offends anyone, it means that it immediately needs to be shut down. It is still something that I think we should be paying attention to and listening to. Um, and I'm uh, and I and I'm wondering whether I should be continuing to use uh, the term or not. I've heard some people say that it should be, that we should just call them GMs and not refer to Game Master. Just use the, just use the abbreviation. Oh, it's a GM and that's it. And I don't like that because if someone's like, what does GM stand for? You're right back to where you were before. So, um, yeah, reclaiming language is another four hour discussion. Four hour, more like four week for a month. Uh, so, uh, Requiem says, I think it comes to flexibility. There's nothing inherently wrong with the term game master, but if someone at your table does not care for the term due to some context, then it is important to accommodate to the request if within reason. Possibly, but I'd also point out that um, if 99% of people are comfortable with saying a word and 1% are not, that 1% is very easily ignored and they may choose not to speak up because they may feel like they just, ugh, I know that it really upsets me, but it's not worth getting into. So they don't speak up. And so it never gets fixed. Uh, so flexibility is the case. Absolutely. If somebody came to me and said, please don't use this term uh, around me and it, they were a part of my game, then I would do my best to accommodate. Brain Turnout says not easy easy to understand there is a big difference game master encompasses a lot in it and just from the term people can get a very good idea for what the role does without even much of an explanation if people come up with a term that does the same good but without something like that i can't see myself using another term uh i've seen a bunch of examples here that i think could work game crafter uh is pretty evocative i still think storyteller is evocative um arbiter judge referee all of these things make a certain amount of sense uh so it also can depend on the game. Uh, a generic term, that's the thing that I think is difficult. And that's where I don't necessarily have an answer for you yet. But it it's game maestro. Interesting idea. But like also, does that mean that we have to take away master's degrees from everybody who holds a master's degree? Because a master's degree implies that you have mastery over a subject. Control person. Um, that's where I was going with conductor. Yeah, like, so it, it comes down to like where what is generic and what is not. I don't think that I would necessarily think you're a bad person if you continue to use the term game master. I'm not even certain that I'm gonna abandon the use of the term myself. Not yet. I have to do a lot of thinking and, and talk to people and listen. Um, even though my preferred term is still storyteller. Uh, the it's sort of like what Puka Jutsu had said, has said, um, if you don't mind my bringing this up, Pook, um, that on his channel, uh, he's brought up the idea that he doesn't like the term sus, uh, because sus has a, uh, it has a root in, um, othering homosexuals way back in the day, right? It was to, to call someone sus was to imply that they were acting suspicious because to act in any way that could be interpreted as gay is suspicious and therefore worthy of suspicion. And it was tossed as sus. 
I think that 99.9% of people who use the term sus today is because they watch Twitch streamers use the word, this person looks sus, because sus was easier to write than suspicious in a game like Among Us. So am I going to necessarily come down on somebody for using the term sus? No. Pook doesn't. But Pook would rather not use that word himself. And will tell people that he's not comfortable using that word. And I think that that's completely legit. And I think the Game Master might start entering into that sort of category with me. Not a word that I'm instantly going to be like, you shouldn't use that word, but a word that I might want to be like, cautious of, aware of, that it may not be necessarily for everybody. I'm going to have to do a lot of thinking about this. But more, more than thinking, I'm going to have to do a lot of listening about this. So if you have opinions, whether they're like, Brain Torn Out, where he believes that Game Master, he, she, I'm sorry, I don't actually know your gender, uh, uh, where there's a, uh, uh, um, I don't necessarily want to say that uh, one person is right or one person is wrong. If you believe that Game Master is a perfectly appropriate term, then I want to hear why. And if you believe that Game Master is a term that's offensive, I also want to hear why. But if you believe that it's not necessarily offensive or non-offensive, but that there's better alternatives out there, I want to hear what those alternatives are. Because as we're moving forward, I would rather feel like at least I was open to the conversation and actively listening to people instead of automatically assuming that I'm correct. Because that's how I've spent most of my life, being correct by default. And I don't want to be. I want to be correct when I'm supposed to be. And I want to be wrong when I am. And I want others to know it. So, uh, yeah, it's not about censorship. Very specifically, uh, this is not about censorship. I am not saying that we're not going to use the M word, right? Like, the, the, I'm not equating more weight to this than it has. I'm just saying that I got to learn and I got to listen. And I can't make the assumption that I know everything. And hearing people talk about it is going to help me form an opinion and shape the way that I move forward. Because maybe there is no change necessary. Maybe there's no change necessary in 99% of the circumstances, but I should be aware that that 1% might be out there and be aware that maybe I shouldn't use it in all circumstances. Or maybe it's a term that needs to change. I'm going to have to keep listening because I don't have all the information yet. And one clinic hours, even especially one 25 minute session of clinic hours, isn't going to be enough for me to come to that decision. So I invite you to uh, to let me know. Let me know what you think. And also let me know if that conversation is difficult for you, because I do want to hear that as well. Um, and if you decide to discuss this on the Discord, that we have, which I thoroughly recommend that people uh, tune in and, and see because the Discord's a great place to have these sorts of discussions. Uh, just please do it in a uh, in a polite fashion, in a respectful fashion, uh, and understand that if somebody thinks differently, whether you're on one side of the debate or the other, we're all here to just muddle our way through life. So either way, uh, as Kate has said, thank you for using your word holes, folks. Tomorrow is going to be punchy over on twitch.tv slash Elizabeth A. Neal. That's over at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 1800 hours. On Saturday at 11 will be the rewatch for Exalt Twitch Academy episode 11. A big deal episode. It would be worth it to go and have a look because that would be interesting to see. Uh, and then also Drew Crew will be happening at 3 p.m., possibly doomed at 6. We'll see. Uh, that is yet to be announced. I know that Liz and Scott have been very busy recently. Sunday is going to be Exalt Ridge Academy episode 12. That's over on this channel, 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Come and watch us play Exalted 3rd Edition, a dragon-blooded game. It would be really, really cool. Uh, I appreciate you indulging that last bit of conversation with me. I really appreciate uh, Brain Torn Out and Mangani and uh, Kung Fu Fenris, Pukajutsu, Zen Robo, Requiem Lost. Uh, I'm probably missing people. Dith, uh, Seren Zero, uh, all of your uh, 
all of the things that you brought forward are really appreciated. And if I miss you by naming you, it's not because I meant to. Um, but uh, listening involves listening to all sides. So let's listen. Because sometimes, while it's really important to use your word whole, it's also very important to recognize when someone else is using theirs. We'll see you next time. <laughs>